good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How thrilling to see such a busy hall. You left your tea and coffee behind to come and listen to. It's definitely going to be the best panel of the day, apart from all the other ones. I'm obliged to say that. Put it in the contract. Uh, a subject couldn't be, I think, more vital at the moment, and with strong views, I'm sure, across the panel and in the hall. It is uncivil war. Can our polarised society find peace? In fact, I'm going to vary that a little bit, panel, and say societies, because I think one of the things that's come out, particularly from the, the last event that I was at with the, uh, two of my guests, was that we found some commonalities across the Atlantic and some differences. So I think we can range pretty widely. Uh, some of you will have uh, already seen a, a couple of the panel members. Let me introduce them all, uh, if you haven't. So uh, we start with a, a, a clean sheet. Starting at the far end is Candace Ernst, we know best-selling author, in some cases marginally controversial, uh, very outspoken, and I think, Candice, what you've done really with your book Blackout, How Black America Can Make Its Second Escape from the Democratic Plantation, see what I mean about that. <laughs> about the previous claim, is you stick your neck out and you don't mind having the debate that follows in an open and generous spirit. Uh, Candace is also founder of the Blexit Foundation with the aim of taking conservative American values into urban communities. So we might touch on that along the way as we talk about what drives division and whether we even agree uh, if we agree to what degree we are divided or not. Sam Leith uh, in uh, the middle is, many of you will know, his work as literary editor of The Spectator, but also an author of Right to the Point, How to Be Clear, Correct and Persuasive on the Page and on the Stage, Sam Leith. <laughs> and next to me is Lionel Shriver. I feel like I've been reading Lionel Shriver's novels for Ever. You should start if you haven't done so. She is both prolific to the point, she's often merciless in her observations of the way we, we mere humans interact, but she always has something fascinating to say about human relationships and the societies that drive them and vice versa. Her latest is Should We Stay or Should We Go? That is uh, out now and, as you know, you'll be talking about uh, books and book buying a bit later on. But Lionel's also very well known for her role uh, in the cultural debate in Britain. In fact, I found a lovely quote. Lion, I might start with you. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote this in a polarized and broadly illiterate digital universe full of predators gorging on animosity, determined to read whatever they wish to. Words cease to function. I think you're living proof of the <laughs> opposite <laughs> of, of that claim. But you go on to say, all nuance goes out of the window. Language no longer serves to communicate. What we writers do for a living is pointless. Well, not so much. But give us, if you could, your thoughts on the proposition that we are a divided society, societies. Um, and can we find peace? Do we even want to? Um, well, yeah, up to a point we don't want peace. It's boring. So, you know, a degree of conflict in a society is healthy and interesting. So... I guess the real question is, uh, are we much more divided than we used to be, or are we suffering some kind of presentism, and uh, we exaggerate the differences of our current society and underappreciate how much turmoil we've had in the past, and I think there's probably something to that. Uh, however, uh, within my lifetime, I would say that um, certainly the United States is more divided than it's ever been, and that includes the 1960s, which um, I lived to see. Uh, there was definitely a sense in the 1960s that uh, we were divided into teams. Um, the right was the much larger team and the more dominant. Um, and uh, there, there, was, there was a sense of a lot of change in the air, and, and, and a, there, were also, there was also a sense of culture wars then. You know, that, but, and it was the left that was trying to break all the taboos and um, fast forward. Uh, 
I find that the, the divide is much deeper than it's ever been, and it's more personal than it's ever been. It's social now, it's not just political. Uh, the U.S. is uh, segregated uh, more on, along political lines than it is along racial ones, uh, which I find shocking. Uh, I, I test, can testify to knowing a single Trump supporter, and that makes me unusual for a registered Democrat, because most registered Democrats don't know any. Uh, and and I, I don't believe that's healthy. I don't think that's just interesting. Um, it means that uh, on, a day, on a level of daily life, we are actually surrounded by people who agree with us and we're not, we're not having uncivil wars. It's worse than that. We're living in completely different universes. And within, we're living, in the United States now, we're now living with completely different sets of facts down to who won the last election. And this is not, you know, this is not healthy, amusing debate. This is, uh, 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 this isn't separation into teams, this is separation into armies. Now, to the, the degree to which that translates over to Britain, is up for grabs. I don't think there's any question that there, while I wouldn't make any immediate parallel between um, Trump and Brexit, there certainly is a, a parallel in terms of the division that, that those issues have instigated in both societies. And one of the weird things about the endurance of the leave-remain divide is that it seems to be translating into other issues and they're the same teams slash armies. It has been completely bizarre to see how the Remainers are much more passionate and much more paranoid about COVID than, than Leave supporters. That's completely irrational, right? in the same way that the Trump divide has translated into whether or not you wear a mask. Trump supporters don't want to wear masks. This is crazy, right? There's no reason for epidemiology to have been connected. So, I mean, that suggests that even in Britain, the divide has a durability that is a little fearsome. Sam, to what extent do you see differences and similarities across the Atlantic? And there's also an interesting debate, I was reading a rather good uh, essay just pulling together a lot of books on tribalism in, in the Atlantic uh, recently, which said basically you come to either the view that tribes drive division and this increasing so-called tribalism, that we now will talk about tribalism as if it was always a, a given. Some people might want to, to question whether that's the case, but we often do. Or whether it's the other way round and that the differences have existed and that through various means, possibly social media, possibly greater transparency in lots of areas of life, we're now more aware of them and more likely to be in, in tribes. Do, do you fall clearly on either side of that divide, divide so to speak? Sorry, you're asking me or Candice? Uh, I'm going to you, Sam, first. Oh, um, I think, I mean, I look at it slightly as a you know, student of rhetoric, and you know, all rhetoric starts from this idea of the ethos appeal, i.e. how you shape your audience into an us and into a group. And um, I think that what's happened, and I think it's been massively supercharged by digital media um, and by the way that the algorithms set us up to create a sort of sense of who our team is and what's more, to be interested in the other team only in as much as they're a way of, you know, kind of affirming our ethos with our own team. I think that's been very hyped up, that ethos has become much more important than of the other ones of Aristotle's triad um, logos, which is the sort of straightforward arguments. Um, and ethos and pathos, pathos being emotion. Um, because social media is set up, it travels socially. And I remember talking to Jonah Peretti, who was the founder of BuzzFeed, and he mm. said, well, the way we set up our site, the logic of it is social. The logic of it is emotional. So we don't have categories like news, sport, weather. We have categories like ZOMG, WTF, LOL. 
um, so that people, sh and he said, you know. There'll be a test it, on that later. Yes, there'll be a test, you know. Um, but he said, he said, you know, and it is obviously the way that all of these social media companies monetize yeah. their content is that, say, Facebook, what travels notoriously is something that elicits an emotional reaction. And the way it travels is through networks of friendship and the elective affinities of these social mm. connections. So you are, by definition, spreading things through a social group. Unlike the old-fashioned old, old media world, in which, to an extent, I mean, in this country, you know, you were tribal, you know, you were a Times reader, you were a Guardian reader, you were a Telegraph reader. You would probably have a set of sort of social and political affinities that would be gathered around some of your consumption habits. Mm. But the newspapers and the BBC and the, the, the kind of larger media would essentially share your, sorry, share similar news. They would agree on what the news was. And as the media landscapes become more disaggregated, you know, you can quite literally exist in a complete news bubble whose logic is intensely tribal. And I think, again, because our attention spans have been sort of crunched down by the fact that the internet is an economy whose currency is attention, is clicks, um, with these ever-shortened attention spans, sort of argument, again, becomes almost by proxy. You know, you haven't got time to think through an issue, or, or better yet, to think through a set of issues as a portfolio of, you know, actually, I might agree with that, and they might have something there, but they're totally wrong about that. Yeah. You tend to take a set of positions now off the peg, because you haven't got time, and because you know that your retweets, your likes, your, you know, your tribe will be affirmed. You know, rhetoric can do two things. It can affirm and speak to your own people and gather that audience together into one, or it can try and reach across the aisle and say, look, I know you're over there, but if we can find this much commonality, I can bring you a certain distance in my direction. And that, now it's very much the first thing it's doing. And as Lionel says, and I think she's absolutely right about this, there's a sort of off the peg slate of positions you take that the culture war now kind of magnetizes. So, for instance, you know, as Lionel rightly says, epidemiology, which you wouldn't think would be an obvious thing that would split along, say, lines to do with your position on libertarianism, your position on economics, your position on, um, you know, race relations, your position on any of the other things that might divide political positions. <coughs> so, I think, I mean, an example of two things that flock together, you know, I would say often the same people who are very, very anti lockdown in this country at least, are also very, very anti-vaccination. And it would seem to me that if you don't like being shut in the house, getting a vaccine that would make it easier for you to leave the house would be at least a position that several people would occupy. But it seems to be like, no, you're on this side of the culture war, and therefore you take both these positions, whether or not you know, there's a different way of By the way, I would interject here that that is a a conflation of positions that the media reinforces, so that when there's a when there is a uh, protest march against lockdowns, they're described as anti-vaxxer protests, inaccurately. So the media is part of the problem, because not just social media, but legacy media keeps the tribes in in their discrete boxes. Well, I think we follow. I just, uh, Sam, will you just finished your thought there? I might just yeah, get yeah. Uh, Candice in answer, answer because yeah, actually, well, it's such a lot already, as you can see, that would, would spark some debate. Maybe a, a bit of challenge for me. I, I wondered really whether the commonality, Sam, just briefly before we, we go to Candice, was uh, that actually both positions have a distrust of the state underlying them. Perhaps they mm. are more similar. Yes, they, they, they may be, and there's a yeah. coercive issue. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm use, plucking it as an example to say there's somewhere where you might see a third position emerging, right. Right. but we pick our team and The tend first to stick of many it. chairman's quibbles for Sorry. me. Yes. For me. Uh, Candace, these two have been, uh, been debating before, so I, I see this as a kind of like one of those Federer and Nadal rematches. <laughs> um, it, always high quality to watch. I wondered that phrase that uh, Sam used, Candace, uh, about currency of clicks. Well, you're a great beneficiary, a beneficiary of the currency of clicks. You have many millions of followers, you lean into the phenomenon of social media looking for, and in many ways, glorifying, magnifying differences. Are you just good with that? You think that's a 
good way to put your views across. That's how you will get the best buy-in from audiences, even bigger than this one. Uh, or the, it's an element of it that causes you any concern about the, the device of nature. Hmm. I feel like that was a little bit of an insult wrapped as a question. I don't magnify differences. Um, I present the other side, and I think it would be um, really good for uh, journalists, as, as they call themselves, uh, to take a look at why it is that um, more people are interested in watching me on social media than on watching legacy media. Why, why is it that Candace Owens, uh, you know, who didn't go through your channels to get to where you got, um, is able to garner more attention across the world than people who view themselves very highly in legacy media? Um, and so I'm going to agree with um, uh, Lionel that it, the media is a huge part of the problem. The media created this predicament and the divide that we're experiencing, uh, particularly in America, so I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to speak on behalf of what's happening in the United Kingdom, uh, is because it, the legacy media lies about the people. It, they just lie about the people. And, and without any regard to stop and slow things down to assess what, why are we in this predicament? Why did Trump win? Um, it, it is, it's foolish, it's just completely foolish to think that you know, 65 million people uh, were white supremacists in America, just float, were floating around, just waiting for an opportunity to put their Ku Klux Klan hoods back on. Uh, and they saw Trump and they went, yes, here we are, let's be white supremacists again. That's foolish, it's actually, it's also intellectually bankrupt, right? But journalists are not interested anymore. They're not interested in trying to understand what the Trump phenomenon was. Why is it that this man got 65 million votes when he ran uh, the first time and then increased that uh, to, to 80 million votes, in, uh, inclusive, by the way, of black people? He doubled the support amongst black, uh, amongst black women. He gained eight points amongst black men, the, the dangerous white supremacist. But rather than be interested in going, hmm, maybe there's something I'm missing here, they continue to lecture. And they lecture and they lecture and they keep calling people more names. And they say, oh, there's just more white supremacists than we even thought imaginable. In fact, he's awakened even more, 15 million more white supremacists than he had when he first ran. It's foolish, right? So I do what journalists used to claim to do, right? And actually listen to what people are saying and I present my side and I do so unapologetically, meaning that most people try to do the same thing, but they're castigated. They're, they're called white supremacists, they're called bigots, they're called, it's just, it's a game of name calling, right? Uh, and even saying that, you know, my metric is built upon getting clicks to be divisive. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure why it's considered well, to be- I didn't say in order to be divisive, I said that one, one side effect of social media, or you could argue it is part of the model, which I think was what Sam was reflecting. And, I, and you I might agree. want to come into the I agree. open conversation, is that this happens, that a lot of people will be following you because they want to know that they are getting something they already agree with. Now, to an extent, that is divisive. Whether you intend well, that's, to, that's to nice be divisive because they're, at least or not. they're seeing their views represented, and that's my point, right? But legacy media does not represent the viewpoints of the American people. They just don't. Um, in fact, they spend more time lecturing and name calling the American people than they do even presenting both sides. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean, I would say to you give, one, one thing: when you say legacy media, I mean, it, you know, there isn't like a title called legacy media, right? There are lots of journalists doing lots of different things. You can, I mean, you and can, then you have so many followers. Really, you could say you're a journalism brand in and of yourself. You're a media media brand in and of yourself. And I'm not, but I'm not legacy media, right? I'm not CNN, I'm not MSNBC, um, I'm not the New York Times, and I'm not the Washington Post. Well, so I why we're am all I the future once. I mean, we're all somebody's legacy, and we all something yeah, well, comes I think after if this us, is semantics, right? it's not, I think we're missing the point here. Um, but, you know, I was actually saying legacy media because I, I understood what you said, Lionel, when you said it. And, and mm -hmm. that's, I was drawing off of her saying legacy media. Right. And, and what's transformed and what's given people like me a platform um, is the fact that the majority of people are not seeing their views represented, um, and they're being told that their views are, are a part of something called, you know, wrong thing, wrong thing. You just are not allowed to even say, uh, you know, that uh, children shouldn't be picking their genders. You're not allowed to say that, right? Um, you have people that are having their entire careers ruined because they say a sentence like, only women should give birth. I trended for three days because I tweeted, only women can give birth. That's not normal. I shouldn't trend for that. I shouldn't have a, that shouldn't make someone get millions and millions of views. That shouldn't be a, a sense of controversy, and yet it is. So I think what's happened is that leftist ideology has gotten increasingly more radical, but increasingly more insistent that going against the orthodoxy, right, of, of what they believe, um, is, is something that they must attack ferociously. A lot of my views and clicks actually are coming from people who hate me 
right? Mm -hmm. Because they, they have to tell me that this is not allowed. You are black. You must be a victim. You are not allowed to be a conservative. You are not allowed to think this way. They think there's something proprietary about my blackness, um, and, and they expect me to be fearful of the firestorms that they create, and I'm, I'm just not. So, um, yeah, I would attribute it more to a sense that people are looking to see their views represented and looking to feel like it's okay to say things that were totally fine to say 10 years ago. Uh, Lionel, come on in on that. Well, I was just going to say that you as a phenomenon are um, a useful um, counterweight to this whole divided phenomenon because you are violating categories, right? right. You're, uh, all black people are supposed to be left wing. That's the rule. <laughs> and um, you're not doing what you're supposed to. And I think that uh, in, in, a, in an era that we've become horribly attached to categories, um, and that's the whole identity politics shtick, is that we are our categories and nothing more. Uh, breaking those down is, is supremely valuable. Um, another example, I think mixed race people who are increasing in uh, percentage of the population in both the UK and the US are marvelous um, in and of themselves, but also just in defiance of this rigid way of thinking. They don't belong in any of these categories. And it's like, great. You know, let's they're break down behind. the categories. Yeah, they're left can, behind. Can I ask you, Anala, you're still, I think, a registered Democrat. Am I right about that? Yes. And when we talk about, sometimes when we talk about divisions and, and, and tribes, we're now talking uh, as if these are things that have, uh, have sort of arisen or at least been intensified recently. But have you ever felt any tension then between the way the Democratic Party and the movement, progressive movement, has moved? You remain loyal to it in terms of your registration, but a lot of your challenges are around what we're sloppily going to call culture wars, where the left, I think, has been very divided and indeed properly fraught by this. It's uh, perhaps one thing to be standing outside it saying, these are terrible things. But if it's actually part of a political identity as a, as a progressive, has that caused you a pause for thought or concern? Well, I definitely am someone who also breaks down categories a bit because uh, I may be a registered Democrat, but I don't endorse a lot of what have become standard and of quite hard left positions for the Democratic Party. Um, I have felt a, a, a lack of a political home uh, for a long time. I would categorize myself as a social liberal and an economic conservative. And classically, in the United States, there is nobody for that person to vote for. Mm -hmm. right? You can vote for the Libertarian Party, but you're not going to get anybody yeah. elected. So that's pretty much like not having a party. Um, and I, I feel uh, a little at sea in the e UK also. I mean, I um, was self-destructive enough to um, support the Leave campaign, and uh, yet both major, all three major parties supported Remain. Right? That left everyone who supported Brexit uh, electorally out in the cold. So, uh, so I'm accustomed to this feeling of, of not belonging anywhere, of not belonging in anyone's box. Ultimately, I mean, it, it makes it hard to vote, but uh, personally, uh, it's liberating. I don't feel uh, that, that, that various political groups have a, a claim on me, and it, make, it, it means that I am able to think for myself. So that's yeah. good. The truth is that uh, the fact that I'm a, a registered Democrat is, so, is something that I, I use a little bit. <laughs> um, be, because I disagree with the party so much that it's kind of a technicality. <laughs> now, you let the cat out of the bag now, right? <laughs> it's interesting, this sort of taxonomy. It's something you've done very well in it. Well, I, I, Your writing is to look at what categories we think of as categories and how those have shifted. Do you think, you think exactly as, as, as Lionel is indicating, that we are many of us are many much more pick and mix than the political systems we're in. In which case, actually, the tribalism accusation sort of falls a bit if people are really, there is some evidence to support this, I think, in, in the US that we exaggerate 
difference and contrast and paradox. We don't actually see that quite a lot of people are a little bit left on some things, a little bit right on others. What do you on that? Uh, well, I think that, that that's exactly how people are individually and how they should be. And I think that what, I mean, I should say this as someone who, who really doesn't break down any categories at all. Um, you know, I'm a sort of weedy, white, herbivorous, North London liberal. Um, I mean, except in as much as I work for The Spectator, that makes me extremely normative and ordinary. Um, you know, I sort of wouldn't say boo to a goose. Um, but I would note that the, the way that the... I mean, I think the thing is that the culture wars suit everybody. Um, particularly, they suit politicians, because it's a very cheap and easy way to do politics. And... Um, there is, I mean, I'm always sort of put back, you know, every time I hear people, the, the anti-woke rhetoric, the sort of idea, you know, it's these woke people who are doing this and doing that and, and you know, wokies won't let you say anything anymore. Um, I think immediately back to the kind of early 90s, you know, late 80s, when we were having exactly, but exactly the same conversation about what was then known as political correctness gone mad, in which people would inveigh in the pages of newspapers because they didn't yet have Twitter, um, against, you know, it was so ridiculous, they're going to make laws to protect black, lesbian, one-legged, single mothers. Ha, ha, ha. As if there was something intrinsically funny about black, lesbian, one-legged, single mothers. And, the, you know, you might have perhaps had it quite hard. Um, and I remember Naomi Klein, when her first book came out, she's really kind of boo-word to a lot of people because she is definitely on the left of, of the American scene. But she said she'd lived through, as a student, the first years of political correctness. And she said, look, we argued and argued and argued as what would then have been called wokies about identity politics and about whether it was okay for rappers to use the n-word and how we should best designate um, you know people of native american heritage linguistically speaking and she said and we suddenly realized as we came towards the end of the millennium that while we were arguing about language the material basis of society had changed under our feet and that was globalization which i know is something candace doesn't love um, you know, that there'd been this kind of globalized shift in the economy where suddenly these brands and these organizations were more powerful than small nation states, where workers' rights were being eroded and where, you know, from an old-fashioned materialist leftist perspective, this generation completely missed the boat because they were looking at, over there at arguments about language. And I think something similar is happening here. That, for instance, to take the Conservative government, if... You know, it's much, much easier for them to pick an artificial fight about trans people and pronouns, which, you know, is not a subject of enormous impact to an enormous number of people in a material way. It's a, it's a culture war that's going on and it's fierce and it matters enormously to the people who are involved in it. But for the government, it's much, much easier to do that than to deal with some, you know, material real-world problems with, if you like, real-world definable outcomes. And I think that's why the culture wars are, are so popular. And I think they're popular on both sides for just that reason. Thoughts? Uh, I, I actually very much agree with that in terms of talking about why the government place emphasis on it. But on, on the individual level, these culture wars matter a lot, right? And obviously, in, in America, we have parents showing up at school board meetings, there's been this explosion of parent understanding um, that there's something really rotten happening inside of the schools. Um, and you know, obviously, the Department of Education, um, it, it's coming down the pipeline. There's this emphasis on talking about you know, trans rights, to, to use this as an example, um, uh, to a point of uh, insanity. In, in America, to a literal point of insanity, right, where you're firing teachers for using someone's correct pronouns, um, and and yes, these teachers are eventually winning in court, but you're you, oh, and the same thing is happening over here. Oh, is People it? are losing their jobs, jobs because they claim there's such a thing as biological right. sex, right? And, and, bio and I think that that actually it does qualify as insanity. It's insanity. It's actual insanity. Um, you know, you've got ch you've got parents showing up, and uh, as I mentioned to you when we spoke earlier, you know, demanding. Uh, but they shouldn't even never have to demand this, but you know, fighting these educators that believe that pornography should be taught at a low level. This is insanity. This is insanity to think that children need uh, to learn and have an educational course in, in kindergarten about picking their genders. There, there's this overt sexualization that seems to be happening as well. Um, so yes, it, we often ask the question, why is the government allowing this to happen? And, and I think that you could be right, that it's sort of a sideshow and it gets people fired up and they're fighting. But 
you know, how we land, who, who wins this culture war really has significant long-term implications, especially, um, you know, for a society that, you know, we in American society, we feel like we're on the brink of losing. Um, I, I don't know, and this is one of the most controversial things I've ever said, right? Uh, there is no society that can survive without strong men. There seems to be this intentional push um, to weaken our society, uh, to confuse children about gender, uh, to make manhood obsolete, to say that there's something wrong with masculinity, uh, to raise up onto a platform, anybody that's got any, you know, LGBTQ, that they keeps getting longer, by the way, they keep sticking on more letters every couple of years, um, I, and I, I stopped learning after the T, um, and, and, and they just keep moving on and going, well, this, the kids need to talk about this, and it's actually quite confusing for children. Children actually do not have the authority uh, to tell you, uh, you know, who or what they are. I, this I, desire to, to, if you like, suck all the testosterone out of the traditional American man, where's that coming from in your mind? Well, and like I, I was kind of saying to you, I, I know it's happening in the education system, right? But there seems to be uh, from some government initiative to allow that to happen as well. Like there, there's this this emphasis on what was, as you as you correctly noted, point what zero one percent of of people were suffering with gender dysphoria, and yet here we are in the midst of a debate that ma would make you think that it's every single person that's dealing with this issue. So there's well, been this emphasis. I, I think that's very interesting. I, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind uh, flipping it back to something that we, I think you and, and Lionel had a bit of, of, of common ground, and you both used the word insanity to describe it, as you saw it, a uh, vastly exaggerated importance given to this. And yet, we, when you said earlier, and it's a, a very reasonable uh, challenge, lots of things that, that you think are not res uh, respected or given space in the mainstream media, and that's therefore you're bringing audience outside what you call legacy media. But surely then, to either of you, but Lionel, you, you, you did uh, chime in on that, I think, in agreement. If a lot of people think this is important, why don't you give it a bit more importance? You can say it's a very small number of people who have actual gender dysphoria, but if anyone uh, here is either of an age or has teenagers and students, and they are giving this more thought. They're giving sex and gender more thought. They are giving, you can uh, laugh about everything being called the patriarchy, but there's some aspects of the patriarchy that I think are evident in a lot of people's lives that they just don't like. They think it's time to say that. So I wonder like, if one side is saying, look, we're going to start conversation anew. We're going to be brave. We're going to do new conversations, as uh, Candice referred to. Why be so kind of damning about this one? Sex, gender, everything that falls from it. Trans. I can, I can answer if you'd like. I'll give it a yeah, stab. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> a stab. Um, Two stabs. There was, there was a little thought. The yeah. thought bubble was forming from Linus that something is coming. It does directly apply to a very small number of people, but it more broadly mm -hmm. applies to a lot of people because we're talking about children um, and, and how they are educated. But I think the most important aspect of it is that is exactly on this point of the, and it's not all trans people, it's mostly a very narrow band of aggressive activists who are driving through this notion that, that sex is in our minds and there's no such thing as biological sex. Now that is asking the larger culture to accept a lie and to to remove, we are supposed to remove ourselves from physical reality. Right. And that is can I, can I just make very dangerous. Well, it may or may not be, but you changed your name. You changed your name for a name, from a, I a name that's designated sex. sort of female. No, I, didn't, mm. I know you didn't change your sex. But female. Therefore, you had a view of something that was fungible, changeable. You wanted to change it, so you did. So you could argue in the great liberal tradition, if you want to self find what rights follow from it, and where they clash is a political matter. And you cannot no, identify no, no, no. changing your name is like changing your clothes. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, this argument you can't is, is very your wrong. DNA. Biology is real. You, Sorry, can't, you can't change your biology. Of course, you can change your name. You can change your clothes, right? You cannot change your biology. Men are not going to one day be able to just you know, have babies. They don't, they don't have ovaries, right? So that's a, that's a very wrong conflation well, no, there to say changing your name. You're actually investigating your self-identification, self which is a bit different from actually changing sex. Sorry, Lionel, did you want to come self finish Self-identification is different from gender sex. Could you repeat that? I'm talking about physical reality. Yeah, physical reality. And it is not subject to uh, our, the whims of our self-conception. You know, it, it's just not. Sam, so, do you want to? 
Um, I think I tend to come down on the on the materialist side of that argument myself. But um, do you know, until this that particular argument arrived, I'd always slightly poo-pooed the idea, which was very much floated about three, four, four years ago when fake news or what everyone was talking about. And there was this kind of idea that was pushed through by slightly the sort of Jordan Peterson and his mob that it, it was all the fault of the Frankfurt School and this sort of diffusion line of slightly obscure Euro, you know, European philosophical and social theorists who said that everything was socially constructed. And I, I was like, this epidemic of kind of fake news and lies and, and distorted facts that's become the public conversation, you can't blame that on Foucault and Baudrillard. Um, <coughs> you know, practically nobody reads them. I know, if, you know, Theodore Adorno ended up in California, but he didn't complete his march through the institutions there. This is just crazy. Um, but actually, now, particularly over trans rights, the you know, idea of social constructionism and, you know, is at the centre, which is, you know, really is an academic, academic theoretical position. And it's, it's just kind of wild to see, you know, suddenly Judith Butler is trending on Twitter. You know, she, Judith Butler, bless her, she, she belongs in the academy, you know, not, not in the wide world. It's like, you need to keep these things You do make it sound like a mental asylum. <laughs> <laughs> the well, academy. We've been to a university <laughs> recently. The academy. I think we should uh, open up to questions because it's such a uh, large hall. I'm sure what we've got through and other areas, please do uh, open up about divisions or divided societies. And do we actually want to heal the divisions? If so, how? But I just thought before we do that, I'd ask the panel briefly, is there a, a tribe or a group that you've been in socially, politically, where you've had second thoughts, you've left, you've moved on, or you no longer believe what you did. In other words, have you changed your mind on anything in this territory? Candice? I used to be a liberal, so I mean, I think I probably changed my mind uh, the, uh, the most uh, of everybody sitting up here. You know, I, I grew up and very much believed in, which I, I shouldn't even say liberal, I should say leftist ideology. I believed in my own oppression. I believed in victimology. Um, and uh, that was something that was really sold to me through the education system. Um, and I am now so radically opposed to it, and I see all the danger inherent in convincing people, uh, convincing entire generations that they're victims and, and pick a pocket of victimhood. You're a victim because you're a woman, or a victim because you're black. Um, and it, it puts you in the way of yourself, meaning if you, if you believe in yourself to be a victim perpetually, you become your own oppressor. Um, and when I woke up to the lies, thank you. And when I woke up to those lies and I began to sort of assign personal responsibility into my life and realized that that aligned with conservative principles, not, not talking about a party, but you know, conservative ideas, uh, uh, my entire life transformed for the better. And I, I spend every day trying to wake up everyone else uh, to, that, to that brainwash and that liberal orthodoxy that won't serve them long term. Um. Sam or Lionel, any, um, any Well, I'll just, I'll just ship, ship, join ship. in a similar story. I grew up in a standard um, liberal democratic household. Um, my father was very involved in the civil rights movement, which I, I, I've always been proud of. So, uh, But uh, I experienced something of a schism with that background when um, I moved to Belfast. and ended up spending 12 years there and uh, when I first arrived uh, I was well aware that uh, most people like me, my liberal Democrats, were very supportive of the IRA as a, an important liberation movement. It was a it was similar kind of oppression story. And then when I got there I discovered they were a bunch of assholes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or, as I learned to say, arseholes. <laughs> <laughs> They're thugs. They were not liberally minded at all. Um, they were bullies. And, they, um, and, and, and personally very unpleasant people. So that one uh, element in the set of beliefs that I had grown up with being challenged, loosened my relationship to the standard beliefs of my upbringing across the board and uh, really, I think, initiated my, my adulthood rather, rather late in the game, but I grew up. 
I mean, you describe yourself as a North London liberal who wouldn't say boo to a goose. And you, you almost yeah. said Anne shops at Wakers yeah. religiously, usually in the vegan bit. Um, have you changed your mind about anything? Uh, well, I, I, I'm, you know, your basic centrist dad. And I think, I, you know, before that, <laughs> I was just a centrist. Um, but I think actually in the last two or three years, if you'd asked me three years ago whether council culture was a real thing, I think my instinctive position would have been to say, no, what we're just seeing is a lot of people arguing very loudly back at positions that had previously tended to assume that they'd go unchallenged. And over the last two or three years, and I don't think it's simply proximity to this, my colleagues at The Spectator that's led to this, I think I've started to have to go, look, the evidence on the ground is that this is not simply people saying, I think you're an arsehole, this is people phoning up each other's employers and organising pylons, and that actually this is different from Deja. You know, I used to take the view that free speech, you know, that free speech wasn't in crisis. There isn't, you know, this is another goofed up talking point of the right. Um, but I think there is a council culture thing that actually does happen. And it's not de jure in the way that threats to free speech, as we traditionally conceive them in censorship terms, are. But it's de facto and it's very programmatic and deliberate and it is to be resisted so yeah to that extent I think I've changed a view. Okay. Right let's get some questions. Um, uh, the award goes to the gentleman at the front for getting a hand up absolutely in a split second time you knew what was coming didn't you? Well I think you get a reward there you go. Hi this is a question to the whole panel um, and only because you addressed it. Um, trans, uh, discussing transgenderism with children at school uh, good thing uh, harmless or something that causes harm? I mentioned the panel's views. Okay, I sort of feel we got a little bit from Candice. Would you like to just flip flip through the panel quickly on that? It's completely inappropriate. It's wrong, and in, in, in many instances, it's it's to me it amounts to a form of child abuse that's happening in the school system. Children are naturally confused. I babysat for a girl who thought she was a mermaid. I would never say to her, "Yes, you are a mermaid," and however you feel uh, is real. Uh, you know, there's a reason why we're adults and they're kids. Um, and I think that this is actually an issue that is bringing together the left and the right to kind of uh, stay in theme on the panel. Is that this attack on children, this focus on politicizing uh, children, uh, is a step too far for a lot of people. Um, I'm, I'm with Candace in that uh, one of my earliest memories, I was probably about three, uh, was being asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said I wanted to be a bear. <laughs> so it wouldn't really have been fair to ask me if I wanted to be a girl bear or a boy bear. Um, Children are trying to figure their way out in the world, and I just I think it is a cruelty to make them choose which which sex they want to be. Uh, it's hard enough for them to decide what their favorite color is, and um, you know it's hard to be a kid. We I think we tend to forget how hard it is to be a kid, uh, and I think that's putting too much on them. Sam. I'm, I'm going to be a bit mithering about this. I think it depends how old the children are, what the form that discussion takes, what it's about. I mean, it's certainly, this is an issue that's in the culture. You know, my 12-year-old, you know, she's very well aware of these issues. This is what she and her friends talk about. And I don't think it's necessarily inappropriate to talk to a 12-year-old about this stuff. If this is the stuff that a 12-year-old is, is learning about and is interested in, and I don't think, I mean, you know, I think saying to a two-year-old, right, do you want to be a boy or a girl? Right, we're going to pack you off into hormone blockers. Um, you know, that seems to me a caricature of, of the position. Um, I'm always, I, I do always remember, um, which I thought was a very good line. I think it was Zoe Williams's who wrote when she talked about, sec it was when the argument was happening about Section 28, you know, was it okay to talk about homosexuality in schools? And she said, well, I don't understand. These, these people are paranoid that if you talk about homosexuality in schools, the children will turn gay. They try to teach me maths for four hours a week, and I still can't fucking add up after 18 years. Um, so I think it depends what, you know, I don't, I, basically I think, I think it's a complex issue, and I don't think total censorship is necessarily the answer. Let's move on from, from that topic, because we've just got quite a lot else we could cover. There's a lady over here, and then I can see a hand at the back as well, so the microphone can maybe go to the back. Thank you. Um, hi. A very interesting discussion. Um, if we agree that 
uh, the culture wars are divisive. How do we get people to think about issues for their sake, as opposed to aligning with a tribe? Oh, what a great question. Go for it. Who'd like that one? <laughs> You've got to find a We're solution now. <laughs> now everyone's stopped. <laughs> Wasn't didn't they have some experiments? I mean, uh, some American policies, they did take individual, like, people who identified very strongly as MAGA types and people who identified very strongly as kind of, you know, progressive, feely touchy sort of lefties. I mean, actually, not very feely touchy, aggressive progressives, um, and stuck them in a room together and made them talk. Mm. They found that actually they started in these guided conversations to find the areas of commonality, yeah. which is. Interesting when contrasted with the business, which I find terrifying as a finding in social psychology, if you put people who are in the same rough gang, you know, they're on one team, they've all got the red hat, say, but some of them are at really one end of the spectrum and the others are kind of towards the centre. Group polarisation says that rather than finding a point in the middle, they all end up horning out to the end, to the, you know, that a group will become polarised in the direction of its most strident position rather than the one in the middle, which is weird but true. So I think taking the two separate groups is obviously the way to do it, and in person. I would just add that a lot of times people think about having debates and having conversations, but what I've seen happening in America is actually um, a lot of the divide is bridged when people are seeing that their lives are being impacted, when it's no longer a discussion and they're starting to realize, oh, actually, I can see why this is bad for me and it's bad for my life. Um, it's why I've said that I've been tremendously positive about the Biden presidency in America, uh, because for, for so long it was just Trump, 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 I hate Trump, obsession with hating Trump, which allowed this tribalism of I love Trump and I hate Trump. Well, then with the Biden presidency, all of these things that were sort of these people are racist and that's why they want a wall and now we've got you know hundreds of thousands of people coming over the border and people who are moderate Dems lives are being impacted it suddenly is starting to bring people together on that topic and realize okay irrespective of Trump we do have an issue right now with um, illegal immigration in this country the same as the trans issue which it's which at least in America I can't speak for the UK is not a caricature they're actually implementing policies they're legislating this especially in California uh, which is leading the charge on this um, in, in trying to make it so that children have to learn about this stuff in school um, and, and when people see that, they go, hey, you know, I'm a moderate Dem and I believe people should be able to live their lives. But when I drop my kid off at school, you're telling me that the, the teachers have the authority to call my child by a different, you know, sex name. They can call, you know, Sammy, Jimmy all day and they don't have to tell me because of the law. Um, so I think what people are seeing now is that it, because of a Biden presidency in America, um, it kind of allowed for a more realistic understanding of what it was that those previously thought about racist, homophobic, uh, sexist people we're talking about. So I, I always think that the real life stuff is what brings us further together, brings us closer together. No, no, what, one thing uh, that you touched on earlier was having a one Trump voting mm -hmm. friend and you suggested this was not, you know, not a good or a, a healthy thing. There was it's a fairly frequent way that friendship groups have come increasingly to, to reflect a particular view of looking at, at the world. And yet, I wonder how much faith you, you have in this sort of let's bring people together and let's hear two different views. They'll all actually get on very well afterwards. I generally find one, I have to confess, I've done various radio shows along those lines, including one called Across the Red Line. People are very good, I think, at being, when you got them to buy into what you're doing, being thoughtful about their own opinions, do they really very frequently then go away and think, I see things differently? Or are all these exercises in the end kind of doomed or a sort of internal paradox that people started out being fairly convinced and they're not much keen on being less convinced? I don't, I don't think that the issue is necessarily that, uh, w you know, we need to con convince each other of, of each other's positions. Uh, it's a question of whether or not we can get along mm. and can regard ourselves as members of the same larger society and share many of the same purposes even if we have many disagreements. And I, I have to say that my, my personal life uh, suggests that this is possible because I'm a writer. That means if I have other friends who are also writers, given the facts of the matter culturally, they're all left wing, right? So almost all my friends are left wing, and I'm not. And we still get along. There's certain topics we're probably not going to talk about because we're just not going to see eye to eye, and that, that way lies trouble. 
And one thing I will say is I have had the experience now of having one such left-wing friend walk out on the friendship. She can't stand my politics and drew a 13-year relationship to an end um, because, uh, because she regards my positions as basically immoral. And I'm, I'm afraid that this is where some of this, what, all of us getting along is problematic because this is especially on the left. The left thinks that the people on the other side are not just wrong, but they're evil. And therefore, once you've done that kind of demonization, you can't get along and you cannot regard yourselves as part of the same society because these people must be ejected. They are pariahs and you can't consort with them. And it doesn't actually work the other way around. I would never have ended that friendship myself. I don't care how much we disagree. And that's because of the media. And that kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier, is that the media has allowed for that. I mean, within America, I think it's 85% of everything on t TV is left-leaning, right? So everything that they're being told and that's being enforced by the legacy media especially is that this is who Trump supporters are. They're evil people. Mm -hmm. They're not actually, there's no humanization of, well, they may have voted because of the border or because of this and that, which is, which is unique. You know, previously you could be Republican and Democrat, but you weren't painted as evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are correct that the, the people that are the most intolerant are on the left. On the left right now. Without That's question, they're true. on the left. And, and I'm, I'm happy to have political conversation. I'm happy to have political debate. People don't feel the same way on the left because they're convinced that their media is telling them the truth and that these people are, you know, literally Hitler is one of their favorite things, you know, to say, you know. And um, so, yeah, that's why I believe that. They're not uh, big on literally, are they? Yeah, they, <laughs> I know, especially in America, literally, literally. Um, figuratively Hitler. Yeah, <laughs> and so I do think that the media has done more, more harm. Let's get some more questions. Um, I'm just looking towards the back. I'm not ignoring you all at the front, but I'm just aware that if you're in the, thank you. Just we'll take one at the back, and then I think there was a hand. Uh, hi, I can see it. Two, two at the front here. Let's take a couple of questions together because then we can sort of mix up the themes. Yes. Hi, uh, my name, my, I'm here to um, ask a question of Lionel and Candace. I'm a child protection social worker, and I come across infinitely inquisitive children, and I believe that their questions should be answered in an age-appropriate, sensitive way. So in terms of transgender, transgender, which is being discussed, would you say um, education is a form of abuse? Yes. It's a form of indoctrination. It's, be, it's become a form of abuse, abusive indoctrination. So when you have a child that's asking you about transgenderism, that is a bizarre thing for a child to ask. When I was a kid, this was not, I didn't know, non-binary. I, I never heard any of these things in my life when I was coming up in school. You know, we weren't talking about these topics. When I was in kindergarten, I was learning about colors. I was learning about blocks, and I was learning how to calculate math. Uh, now the education system, and I will say specific to America, believes that their role is to psychologically condition children um, and, and to kind of create this, this mold of a child that will eventually, in my opinion, um, become dependent upon the state. That's a, a much larger thesis that we won't be able to cover today. Um, but without question, the, pred the education system has become, has become predatory, um, at least in the states. And, and I think that that is best emphasized by the fact that Statistically speaking, and, and I'm saying this seriously, uh, according to standardized tests, kids are getting dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. According to standardized tests, right? Uh, which is why they want to abolish standardized tests. And yet, we have never given out more degrees in America. That doesn't make sense. That, that, does, that those two sentences should not make sense. Um, but the idea is to, to give these children a ton of degrees and to convince them that, they're, they're, that, they, that what, they, what they know is right. There are 2,000 infinite amount of genders. That is a lie. Your education system should not be able to lie to your children and to simultaneously set them up for failure. Let's get a quick answer from uh, Lionel and then move on. I mean, lots of, we're all taught values as well as math and colouring books to an extent. This is a, an argument about, as, as I understood the angle of the question of, of whether this was uh, sort of okay within the education mission. Well, of course, if you believe in your perspective on the world enough, then you don't then you regard you would regard indoctrination as mere education and and you're just translating your values onto the next generation but um, so I, I agree there's not a hard line between education and indoctrination and it's difficult to to sort that out but there is a difference in my mind between teaching children that uh, all races are are equal um, and, and of equal value, and you can't make assumptions based on what color of skin they are, and, and instead teaching them 
critical race theory and having all the little white children sit in the corner and feel guilty because they're privileged. I mean, that's, to me, that's indoctrination. To people who deeply believe in critical race theory and think that this is an accurate way of looking at society, that's not indoctrination. That's just telling kids the facts. Sam, I think you had sort of answered the question, if it's all right. I, think, uh, no, I, I, might, I might skip. Uh, also, like, although I'm desperately trying to herd cats and it won't work, I'm going to try and get a couple of questions so that we can, we can just uh, move along a little bit. So we've got a gentleman with a hand up there. Just give us a wave. I'm actually horribly long said. I know, the one at the hat. I like this bit, the sort of Adam's family hand at the back. There, hi. We'll take you two and then we'll do, go this side, pantomime style. Hi. Um, just in terms of bringing people together is that historically we've seen both on the sort of right and the left when when political movements start to dehumanize their their opposition mm. that's like the the crazy red flag in the room right that things are, are starting to go south very quickly how do you spot that in in the debate or in the discussion great thank you just to uh, hold your horses and we'll take the the adams family oh sorry there was a hand at the back i think have you got a microphone yet cheers i've got all the power and no responsibility i've no idea who that microphone <laughs> went to but i was actually looking over there wherever the mic is is fine my questions for candace earlier you mentioned about how when the social worker asked about transgender kids and whatnot, and you mentioned that when you were a kid, you didn't really ask those kind of questions. Do you think that you're judging the world and trying to come to your own preconsumptions based on how you perceive the world, and you're invalidating the kids of today and how they actually view the world because they grew up in a different era where there's more information, where people are more free within themselves. However, because you have a certain view of the world, you think, that what you think is valid, and it invalidates other people's wi willingness to learn about themselves more. I think Candice and then perhaps the panel could pick up also on the other gentleman's yeah. uh, question. Um, so I don't believe that the way children feel should be a priority in, in terms of when, when lying to them so that they feel good is, is completely predatory, to me, in my opinion, right? It is not a truth. If a child feels like they're a mermaid, as I brought up the girl I used to nanny for and did not want to get out of the bath, that I should say, well, I don't want to invalidate the way you feel, and so you can therefore stay in the bath all night. There needs to be adults in the room. There is such a thing as truth, and there is such a thing as fiction. Uh, society is not subjective. You can't feel your way into being a woman. You either are one or you aren't, right? So I am not asking people to, to take my perspective and put it in the education system. I'm asking them to put the truth in the education system. That's it. It's, it is true that you know only women can give birth. Um, and so I think that, that that's kind of, which kind of hits on the last question that was asked about you know the, the dehumanization that's taking place. Uh, people that are telling the truth are being dehumanized as bigots. The truth has become a form of bigotry, which is, in my opinion, a very alarming point to be in society. When, when you say something that is factually true, you are dehumanized and you are painted as somebody that is evil and wrong and not validating children's emotions. You know, that's not the role of the school system. Let's remain academic. Teach them numbers. Teach them biology, if it's still, if it's still allowed, right? You know, te te teach them their colors. You know, don't just validate everything a child says and believe that you're helping them. In fact, you're harming them. You cannot get out into society and be a productive member of society if you are operating on a system of fiction. That is a fact. Sam, um, could I uh, see perhaps to the, the, the gentleman's question about the, the red flags? I suppose it's a, it's a good question because we're getting towards our last few minutes, which is kind of, it's the, it's the old tabloid, how worried should we be question. It could be that, you know, this is a great subject for debate. It gets passions uh, roused and blood pumping I in these arguments, but that ultimately, it doesn't matter, we get one of our lives and economics probably dictates much more than identity politics anyway. Or as the gentleman pointed out, it might be a precursor to much worse and more dangerous I think this, this idea of dehumanization is, it seems to me it's something of a red herring because mostly when we talk about dehumanization, there's a sort of implicit dehumanization is the licensing of violence. And of course, we know that the psychology of 
you know, mass violence does begin with dehumanisation and, you know, you, you start to talk about people as cockroaches or scum or maggots or an infestation or whatever it is and that somewhere down the line that licence is violence and there's a lot of hammering at the moment about the idea that certain aspects of political language licence violence but I think the, the, that's pretty rare at the moment. I don't feel like there's a red flag that we're going to descend Trump into a sort of genocidal are, are civil war. Yes, I mean, exactly. No, that, there is... There is that, but what I'm saying is that, that that sort of metaphorical thing, I don't, for the most part, think that the, the worry is the step, you know, from, you know, an unfortunate metaphorical use of language to literally Hitler to, you know, bloods running in the streets. I think it's, it's of concern. But I think the more immediate issue with that sort of language is actually that it departicularizes your opponents. It doesn't grant them the complexity of human beings, and it means you're able to dismiss their arguments qua team rather than qua argument that you're going they're wrong not because this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong they're wrong because they're them they are you know wokies or they're a wall of gammon or they're white supremacist maga hatted gits or they're you know <laughs> legacy, media. Le le legacy media or they're liberals or they're you know and that idea that which is a lazy one and it's very available to us psychologically yeah. to just say, right, we've found a box for you and nothing about you is particular. You're simply a representative of the members of that box. And I think that's the problem because that screws up the debate. And I think the debate being screwed up and the material consequences of that will come hopefully long before we have the, um, you know, hell to skelter civil war. But, you know, I might be wrong. Uh, Lionel. Uh, well, there has been um, some pretty serious violence, especially on the west coast of the United States, uh, between these gangs of protesters on either side of the culture wars, and you know, the Antifa people and the, and I guess you'd call them Trump supporters or, um, and, and it has sometimes got pretty nasty. Uh, I would say that I'm not sure this, I would say this of the UK right now, but certainly of the US, there is the capacity for violence. And all it takes is a single incident on video as we saw so uh, vividly with the George Floyd. So, I mean, that lit the entire world on fire. And we're always just, you know, one little click away from another such incident, polarizing people. and. And I think that there, there is enough dehumanization, especially from the left to the right. Uh, I don't think that both, both sides are equally culpable. I'm not saying that the, the, the right does do the same thing, just not as predominantly as the left right now. I feel that we're really in our last uh, couple of minutes. I'll try and get a couple of questions, and then, Pamela, you can also use them for your concluding thoughts. If we can vary topics as much as we can. I'll take the hand in front of me, uh, sort of here, and... Uh, so have you taken another question? Is that you've been waiting for ages? All right, go on. Then. <laughs> I'm just so soft-hearted. Okay. So here and here, thank you very much. I'm sorry, right. there's a, a lot more hands up than I could get through. Uh, you, keep, let's keep the pace up. Um, please, short questions and haiku-like answers from my brilliant panel. A question for the panel: um, Your thoughts on the polarizations between different generations? They say the uh, baby boomers and Gen Z. Gen Z being more mixed race and perhaps less nationalistic than the baby boomers. Great, and those of us Gen X in the middle are just perfect, sir. We're like the Goldilocks porridge. Uh, and the question. Thank here. you. In the spirit of the question, or the spirit of the title, can our polarized society find peace? And rephrasing an earlier question, how do we make people find peace? Turn it around. Is, do you see a path to resolution where we do find peace? What, what might happen, I don't know whether it's naturally happened, but what might happen that you know, puts the, the center uh, back in the curve? That is the perfect concluding question. That's a presenter's friend here in the audience. So you can take either of those, uh, scrunch them together into your answers. Sam, I'm gonna kick off with you. Oh, um, I think the generations don't understand each other at all, and I think that's a good thing because that's always been the case. Um, <laughs> What's going to solve it all? I, t I wish I could say. I can't. Just, just keep reading the arts and books section of the spectator. Exactly, just keep to reading the arts and, the and my debate. book on rhetoric. <laughs> yeah, did your job there. Uh, Candice. 
Uh, yes, uh, obviously there's big differences in terms of the generations, um, and I think a part of it is that there, it used to be this exchange of ideas where you would, you know, your parents would tell you one thing and you'd say, okay, I disagree with that, and you know, the next generation is going to do a little bit of different, but then when you get older you realize there's a lot of wisdom in some of the things that your parents said, so you would take some of that and you'd bring it forward. Right now we have this sort of cultural Marxism taking place and they want nothing to do and it, it needs to be a complete undoing of everything that existed because it's all wrong and it's all backwards and that's dangerous. Um, to answer your question about, you know, how do we fix it? It's a very big question, but I think part of it, and I, and I think I'm representative, obviously, of this school of thought, is that people need to think deeply and examine their relationship with legacy media, with media. And I'm not talking about just in the present sense. I'm talking about going back and looking at it in a historical sense. I'm completely miffed in, in, in the time where statues must be torn down, how the New York Times and the Washington Post are still allowed to print publication. Um, it, every human atrocity that's taken place um, in the world of a legacy media was on the side of the people committing the atrocities. Uh, the New York Times once wrote lovely things about the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the, the, the science uh, told people that black Americans were fundamentally dumber and therefore the way they were being treated was okay. Uh, they like you to forget their history as they kind of write the same present. Um, and I think that until people really understand that you know, traditional, the, the traditional media structure is, is, is designed to tell you what to think and not ha how to think, um, you know, we're, we're kind of barreling towards, uh, or we'll continue to barrel towards this highly divisive society. Uh, turn off the TV and start actually speaking to the you know, people around you and you'll probably figure out that that person you think is so evil and rotten um, is not. You know, we're all human beings, we all want to be better. Um, and we have more in common than we do um, in, in, in terms of differences. Lionel, um, last word goes to you. Um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, perhaps perversely rooting for some enormous problem to come along that would be real and substantial and shared. And therefore, all this... Uh, little stuff, really, um, in many ways, made up problems of the likes of identity politics would just disappear because suddenly we had a big real problem. And then came COVID and it didn't work. <laughs> so I'm out of solutions for now. <laughs> you can always come back as a bear and have, have another run at it. Um, Thank you very much indeed. My wonderful panel, were, they have written books galore between them and they will be signing them at a tent near you. Go and say hello to them and uh, pick up a book. And thanks so much to all three of you and to you for your wonderful questions. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.